Frogbit Blog. Hello and welcome to episode 32 of the Frogbit Blog podcast. Um, on this episode, the man in the pub gives me Leonardo DiCaprio's new number and I ring him to speak about his new eco shoe. We have Alex the Parrot in Nature is Clever. Mary, by popular demand, is back on the show. And um, there's all sorts of other things going on, so listen up, eh? So, what's been happening? Um, well, some big news is that Monsanto have been ordered to pay $289 million as a jury has ruled that the Roundup weed killer has caused a bloke to have cancer. Dwayne Johnson, a 46-year-old former groundskeeper, won a huge victory in a landmark case recently with the jury determining that Monsanto's Roundup weed killer caused his cancer and that the corporation failed to warn him of the health hazards from exposure. The jury found that Monsanto acted with malice or oppression. Right, I'm going to talk about this um, more detailed later in the show. Now, here in the UK, it's cub hunting season. Yes, you heard it right, cub hunting. Hunting baby fox cubs, feeding them to foxhounds so that they get used to the taste of blood. Now, why would foxhounds need to get used to the taste of blood when fox hunting is illegal and all the fox hunters doing, apparently, is going for a ride in the countryside? I hear you ask. Because they are law-breaking fucking liars that should be locked up. I reply. Um, Disgusting, absolutely disgusting. Please consider donating to or joining the Hunt Saboteurs or the League Against Cruel Sports or Stop the Cull, Keep the Ban, one of those organisations because these people must be stopped. What they are doing is illegal. Now, some live news from Germany. We have a reporter on the scene. She is out on the streets of Karlsruhe, where police are gathering after a call from a man in trouble. He said he was being terrorised, so we think it may be terrorist-related. And here we are live from the BBC. I'm standing here at a barrier with lots of other reporters trying to get an update on an incident that has been described as a possible ongoing terrorist incident involving a German man. Oh, look, here he is now. He's just vaulted the barrier. If I run alongside him, I might get an interview. Achtung, Achtung, I am being terrorised. What's happening? Are you being chased by terrorists? Oh, my God, I've been chased and chased and chased. I think my life was in danger. I had to ring no, no, no. That's 999 in German, listeners. It's coming after me. I could not shake it off. I'm so scared, so I had to call the polizei. It? So was it a terrorist? No, it was a baby squirrel. It had teeth and everything. You what? A baby fucking squirrel? <coughs> um, um, you were chased by a baby squirrel, so you called the police. Uh, it wouldn't leave me alone. I was so scared. Mutti, Mutti, ah, meine Mutti. Ich liebe Mutti. Ah, meine eine kleine Mutti. Mutti, Mutti. It's here. It's holding me tenderly and purring. Is that it? I drove all the way here to find you been chased by a baby squirrel that wants you to be its mother. Oh well, back to the studio. Yep, so German police have rescued a man after he called for help, saying a baby squirrel would not leave him alone. Officers sent a patrol car out to investigate and arrived to find the chase still in full flow. But the drama ended suddenly when the squirrel, apparently exhausted by by its exertions, lay down and abruptly fell asleep. Officers took pity on the animal, which had probably become separated from its mother. Police said it likely targeted the man because it was in search of a new home. It often happens that squirrels which have lost their mothers look for a replacement and then focus their efforts on one person, said Christina Krentz, a police spokeswoman. She said the animals could be very persistent, not just running behind someone, but entirely fixated on them. It can be pretty scary. The man didn't know what to do, so he called the police. He was certainly feeling a bit threatened.
threatened. But the police on the scene appeared to be more amused and alarmed. Our new squirrel will be our new mascot. It will be christened Carl Frederick, said the police right up. The squirrel has just fallen asleep in fright. Krenz said, it was just a bit of fun. The officer thought up a name that would suit the baby squirrel. Officers took the sleeping Carl Frederick into police custody and then to an animal rescue centre where it was said to be doing well. Oh, my God, what a happy ending to a strange story. From Big Blob. Right, well, Mary's not been on for a while, but the, um, she's been back now. She's back by popular demand. So... Hello, Mary. What have you been up to? Hello, listeners. I've been trying some of that there meditation, like, but I think I've been doing it wrong. I, well, I did see you while you were meditating and you were doing a little jig whilst holding two jam donuts. What was that about? Well, I was doing a meditation for abundance, but I think I got the wrong kind of abundance. Oh, well, watch yourself with them there cakes. What have you been cooking today, Mary? Well, Paddy, I thought I'd do her some nice vegan food. Ooh, sounds lovely. What's it called? Well, I've called it fry. Fry? Why? Wes, well, I was going to do you a stir fry, but I couldn't be feckin' asked to stir it. So you're getting feckin' fry. Sounds lovely. It's good to have you back on with your little pearls of wisdom, Mary. That's all right, Paddy. You're paying me, so don't mind. OK, great. Right, so back to the Roundup case. I think it is important to cover this. Um, So remember, Dwayne Johnson, who was a 46-year-old former groundskeeper, has won a huge victory in a landmark case with the jury determining that Monsanto's Roundup weed killer caused his cancer and that the corporation failed to warn him of the health hazards from exposure. Now, his lawyers argued over the course of a month-long trial in San Francisco that Monsanto had fought science for years and targeted academics who spoke up about possible health risks of the herbicide product. And Johnson was the first person to take um, the Agrochemical Corporation to trial over the idea that the um, Roundup caused cancer. Now, a recent study has found that the herbicide glyphosate, um, which is sold under the train name Roundup, is present at alarming levels in breast milk of American females. The study found that samples of mother's milk from women in the United States contained levels of the weed killer that were 760 to 1,600 times greater than the amount of pesticides allowed by the European Water Directive. Now, sure, you'll hear lots of viewpoints that say, oh, it's safe. Science has proved that it's safe. Well, between 2012 and 16, the company sponsored a series of review articles published in scientific journals, all of which concluded that glyphosate and its commercial formulations were not harmful to health. But there was a recent report out that showed that the industry-sponsored reviews um, of glyphosate's carcinogenicity and genox, genotoxicity contained fundamental scientific flaws, spanning from apparently calculated emissions and the introduction of irrelevant data. Yeah. The reviews also consistently assigned greater weight to unpublished industry studies than to studies that were peer-reviewed and published in sci- um, scientific journals. Now, despite these major defects, regulatory authorities um, concluded that glyphosate is not carcinogenic, okay? And often they've referred to these um, industry sponsored reviews to say that, and I'm sure there's some corruption going on there. Lawmakers and government bodies are taking their views from the Monsanto backed reports that are flawed. Now, in contrast, the World Health Organization's Cancer Research Agency, Research Agency refused to consider the unpublished industry study. Um, and in its assessment of glyphosate, stating that the data presented herein was insufficient and important details were lacking. Um, the Cancer Research Agency states that Roundup and glyphosate is probably carcinogenic, OK? So that's probably carcinogenic substances are getting into breast milk, kids' cereals. In fact, who do you say, you know, in, in all our food? So who do you believe? Um, do you believe the industry that's publishing these false reports or do you believe um, some um, sort of standalone independent scientists? And I think we've got to adopt the precautionary principle, which is 
when an activity raises threats of harm to human health or the environment, precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effects relationships are not fully established. OK, you have to be um, you have to show precaution. And there's a really detailed article in Rolling Stone, which you can read online on the subject. And I'm going to put the link in the show notes. So have a look if you want more details on the trial and the manipulation that Monsanto have been doing for years. Right, well, you might have noticed the deliberate errors I kept making there. I kept saying Monsanto instead of Monsanto. And I kept saying glyphosate instead of glyphosate. Okay, I did it on purpose just to check you were listening. All right. Right, so it's time for... Nature is clever. It's really, really clever. Nature is clever. It's really, really clever. Right, I'm reading a book at the moment called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are by Franz de Vol. Um, I'm going to talk about it more in another episode, do a bit of a review on it. Um, and it briefly mentions a parrot called Alex, who was really, really clever. Um, he lived from 1976 to 2007. Um, that's 31 years, you see. See how clever I am too. Um, he was bought from a pet shop, then trained and worked with an animal psychologist called Irene Pepperberg. And Irene Pepperberg named the parrot Alex, which is an acronym for Avian Language Experiment or La Avian Learning Experiment, which sounds like a band, doesn't it? An experimental band. Now, according to Pepperberg, Alex had shown intelligence of a five-year-old human and the emotional level of a two-year-old human. And again, he outshone the Trump family, didn't he? And he didn't even reach his full potential by the time he died. And Pepperberg said, um, by 1998, Alex and I knew each other so well that we sometimes behaved like an old married couple. One day, irked more than usual by the recalcitrance of other scientists, I stormed into the lab. Before I'd uttered a word, Alex had fixed me with his beady eye and said, calm down. Without pausing to think this was a remarkable thing for a bird to say, I snapped back, don't tell me to calm down. Calm down, calm down. He was obviously a scouse parrot. Calm down. Anyway, Alex learned over 100 words, but it's not just the words he learned, it was the way he used that knowledge. For example... He was shown a tray full of objects. Some were made of wool, some were made of wood, some were made of plastic. They were all different colours. Um, he was allowed to feel them with his beak. And, and after he returned to the tray, he would be asked, for example, what the two-cornered blue object is made of. And he'd correctly answer wool. So he was combining knowledge of colour and shape and material with his memory of what it felt like. Or he would see two keys, one green plastic and the other of metal. When asked what was different, he'd say the colour. When asked um, which colour um, was bigger, he'd answer green. Now, the fact that the object colours and textures were continually mixed up show it just wasn't rote learning exercise. Um, he also didn't need the presence of Irene Pepperberg to answer or to see the object. For example, in the absence of corn, he may be asked the colour of corn is and he would answer yellow. So he was, he, you know, he had a very good knowledge. Um, now, Alex was at around the time when a lot of people presumed that intelligence required large brains. Um, so people were sceptical. But now we know that intelligence is more about the ratio of brain to body size. Now, you can go on YouTube and there's lots of videos of Alex in action. And here's a short clip from when he was on a TV programme. Start off with some animal sounds first. Can you do? Oh, okay, <laughs> got a clear throat. Let's do a wolf. Good. How about a bird? Can you do a bird? Good. Can you do an owl? Good owl. How about a rooster? <laughs> How about a penguin? Can you do a penguin? <laughs> Now, the thing that gets me is um, when people say he's the cleverest parent ever, parent, parent ever, but how would they know? I mean, if you spend your life working with other professors and get trained and trained, of course you can be able to do um, some tricks, but I imagine lots of parrots out there if trained would have the same cognitive abilities, wouldn't they? Um, which just goes to show... Oh, nature is clever, it's so fucking clever, cleverer than Trevor, no, I don't know a Trevor, that's all I'm
Hey, it's Sexy Len time again. Oh yeah, it's Len again. It's Sexy Len again. Oh yeah, it's Len again. It's Len and he's back again. Now, with the past two times you've been in, we were going to talk about messing about with people's bodies, but there's a proper term for it. What's the term? Well, you could call it a biohacking, I think. It's biohacking. Quite a, quite a popular terminology that people are using there. And are people all doing this biohacking? To a certain extent, yes. Uh, often it, it started sort of coming about because of uh, disabilities uh, and people have created some incredible um, sort of artificial limbs and things like that that are really, really helping. Um, but uh, we're going to kind of look at the more extreme side of things, uh, which is going to be things like nanobots are a possibility. Have you heard of those before? What, that they have in you? Yeah, so tiny microscopic robots that can often uh, deliver medicine uh, or could heal the person, um, which could inevitably obviously really quite lead on to cheating death in a way of uh, really yes well interesting it's over cheating death i was on facebook um uh, about the the um, jellyfish mm. that they reckons immortal mm-hmm. that um, regenerates itself and goes back to its infant state and Certainly. i'm thinking if they start getting all of that yeah this, you know yeah. Well, that's, yeah that's almost like genetic modification over yes. uh, over the biohacking aspects of it right but there is also not just it's not just about modification of bodies as well when you're talking about this kind of uh, aspects of it you could be uh, moving into the possibilities of say uh, three people getting together using their uh, their sort of uh, sort of biological DNA and creating one child from it and things like that. So often it can be lots and lots of adaptations that can be done with all of this kind of interesting biohacking aspect. Oh. Um, in the end, it's, you could look at it a bit dystopian as well, where it could be only the rich that have access to this technology, uh, who immortalise themselves potentially. Um, well, yeah, yeah and like, a lot of science fiction writers have written that, as well as in the way there's the drones in the mines and there's the elite, and you can sort of see it happening across the world, can't you? As that 1% get richer and richer, you could mm-hmm. see this dystopian future where um, the rest of us become uh, mere whatever's robots yeah. yeah and what, what would happen if uh, if a corporation had uh, I mean the, the very very simple aspects of biohacking would be uh, a, say a small NFC chip in your finger that would replace your credit card um, or could open your front door that kind of thing obviously that's that's a very minor modification but yeah. that, that, I foresee that to be the start of it along with perhaps people um, uh, it's like instead of laser eye surgery you might have an artificial implant in the eye or something like that but how, then you start... how close is all this how close is the little chip thing well that, that's that's instantly possible and people have been playing around with that for some time at the moment but obviously there's a lot of fears involved with it what would happen if a, if a corporation became in control of all of that and you can't just get it out yeah there's <laughs> going to be a lot of people with fingers missing isn't there yeah well there you go or what we I mean you God, I mean, God, it'd be awful if someone was running around sort of trying to get the chips out of people and things like that. I mean, it'd be really, really awful. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, though, that technology as well, uh, technology often has to adapt uh, to be uh, for cyber security and things like that. So often, if you put a chip inside your hand, then how long is that until it's out of date? You know, they've yes. got, got to yeah. consider these kind of things. Um, but there is a lot of advancements that could happen, like this, like you said, the nanobots uh, for delivery of medicine. So, for example, if you're um, diabetic, uh, you could have nanobots in your body just what, reg- permanently, reg- permanently, in permanently or you yeah, put yeah. in by a doctor. Well, they'll be put in by a doctor, or, or every, or potentially everybody could have them. Um, that's what's quite interesting about it. If everyone had them, then... and well, how would they be pro? Would they be programmed externally, or they put their program before they put them in? Are they in for a specific reason, or do they? Well, if every, if everyone had one, it could monitor everybody's blood pressure, heart rate. Um, it could say you need to exercise more, even something like the Apple Watch I've got on my arm right now would tell me saying you must stand up more often you must exercise yes. slightly more you know yeah, so it's, it's there it's happening isn't mm. it but it's just on the outside it's still. on the outside what if that was internal but not what only that do? Do, do you know about the mechanics would it flow around your body or would it just be sit in a position under your skin and monitor everything at the it? moment obviously nanobots are, uh, uh, unless there's any secret laboratory with them hanging around there they're actually we can't make them that small yet so it probably would be something under the skin uh, but even talking about uh, female contraception uh, you've, you've already got a uh, an electronic device underneath the skin releasing uh, yes. releasing chemicals yeah. what, if, what if that was on a much smaller scale and there was hundreds upon millions of them around everybody's bodies fixing you it's the most extreme of, uh, of, uh, of, sort of the body modification um, and again if we're thinking much more than 100 years in the future what would happen if we're just uh, almost like a, a series of electronic signals inside of a 
an ele- electronic brain if, uh, eventually where we could be uploaded and downloaded all over the place. I mean, that's that's the far, far future we're talking about, and that's that's a serious body modification going on. Yeah. What, there other, is the what body. other body... Do you know of any other body... Modi- body I've got it was saying now, body modification. Body modi. Like body, mod- body modification. Uh, at the moment, it tends to be just uh, more along the line for medical reasons. Uh, there's less in the way of uh, body modification for either entertainment or anything like that. But I think we're very, very close because the technology is becoming so small that it will eventually either be eventually built into contact lenses and then potentially into, more than that. Yeah. And it's actually built into the eye permanently, for example. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, we're already using quite extreme modifications for again for helping people to hear, to to see uh, through color colorblind spectrums to lots and lots of different reasons there but eventually this is becoming going to be so advanced and so cheap that, that everyone will have one yeah an event it could be black market first and then everybody starts wanting it after that i mean who knows Whoa. heavy Whoa. stuff though it eh? is isn't it it <laughs> is yes yeah um and is it going to benefit us? Or it could go out, I suppose, with these things, mm-hmm. it could go either way, couldn't it? It could. Again, I think the inevitability of it is, uh, is, is, going, is there. Um, it's, it probably, it's probably going to happen regardless. Um, but it, a lot of it does scare me a little bit. I think if the idea of having uh, nanobots inside the body that could be hacked, for example, is quite terrifying, isn't it, really? Mm. Um, and obviously you'd have a lot of people rejecting that and being... Uh, I think eventually you probably have people who are uh, purists and would want to remain uh, un unchanged. Yeah, that'd be me, living on an island somewhere. Yeah, living the, the living the simple life. There's, there is always going to be that reaction. But no, um, no, interesting. Um, we've run out of time again. But thank you very much for coming in. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, <laughs> um, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you. It's it's land again. Oh yeah, it's land again. Land. Ooh, land. Right, it's rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people. Now, if you remember, a few episodes ago, I had a Leonardo DiCaprio on the show talking about the beetle that was named after him. Well, Eco Leo has been at it again, and this time he's invented some eco shoes. So I thought I'd try and give him another call. Um, I had to pay the f- um, the fella in the pub thirty quid this time for a new number because apparently he'd gone X directory after I spoke to him. Not sure why, because he had a whale of a time. Um, so let's ring him up live on air to find out about his new eco adventure. Here we go, it's ringing. Top of the morning to you. Oh, God. Jack from Titanic here, otherwise known as Leo DC. Now, how can I help you? Leo, sorry, Jack, it's Frogbit here again. Oh, I remember you, you sarky fecker ego gobshite, aren't you? Yep, that's me. Um, Why are you still doing the Irish thing, Leo? Jack, you mean... Still trying to get back with Kate Singlet. She never married again after I died, you know. Leo, it was a film. I know, but it was my best one, and I got the girl. Yeah, but you froze to death. Anyway, you did Wolf of Wall Street, which was great, and you did you did The Revenant. Oh, don't talk to me about The Revenant. I nearly froze to death in that as well, and I got half eaten by a bear. Bloody awful. Well, you did read the script before you did it. You, you know, before you said you'd do it, didn't you? You read the script. Well, no, you see, when they asked me to do a film called The Revenant, I thought it was going to be about an English vicar or something. That's reverend. Well, I know that now, after I nearly fecking died. Look, anyway, tell us about your new eco project. Well, I've got all birds on me feet now. Well, that doesn't sound very eco friendly. Ha, <laughs> now, you sacky fecker, all birds is the name of me eco conscious footwear. Well, shoes don't go on trees, do they? Well, funnily enough, these feckers do. Let me read you the blurb. Our tree fibre, Tencel, Lyocell trademark, is sourced from South American farms that minimise fertiliser and rely on rainfall, not irrigation. Compared to traditional materials like cotton, it uses 94% less water and cuts our carbon footprint in half. Surely there's a joke there about a shoe with a carbon footprint? What the feck? Anyway, as I was saying... Our Forest Stewardship Council certification means we source materials that meet strict standards to protect forests and the animals in people who depend on them. Oh, right, so it's a shoe made from trees. Oh, something like that. But I must admit, the advert doesn't quite tell the truth. 
Oh, why is that? Well, it describes them as men's tree runners. And? Well, I bought some, got them home, and there was only two in the feckin' box. They cheated me, and I'm the feckin' boss. Look, Leo, I don't think you're selling these very well. Oh, I'm not selling them. I've got the website and all that. Very modern these days. I'm not doing the door-to-door -door stuff anymore. That's not what I meant. Anyway, I've just looked on the website, and it says of one pair, a thoughtful shoe that's light and breezy offers cooling comfort and is ideal for sun-soaked escapades. And they cost $95. That's around 70 quid. I was just wondering, Leo, what's a thoughtful shoe? Um, oh, you got me there and fucked if I know. A thoughtful shoe. Um, let me think. Oh, um, um, maybe it's a shoe that has an inner soul. <laughs> you know, Leo, that was quite funny for you. Um, now, look, Leo, um, do you mean Jack? I'm going to stop you there and I'm not going to let you sing this time. Oh, please, just a quick one. I've come up with an idea for the jingle for the advert that I'm going to put out on the telly. It might help woo Kate Singlet, who well, I'm sure will be listening to this. Are you sure? To be sure. OK, let's hear your jingle. I'm Leonardo DiCaprio Would they call me Jack, you know Come and buy my eco shoes Made from tree and pigeon poo Whoa, 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 hold on a minute there. Made from trees and pigeon poo? What's that about? Well, that was my artistic licence. I needed something to rhyme with shoe. And my shoes are made by a company called Birds. So I thought shoe, shoe, pigeon poo. Look, I don't think you're selling it very well there, uh, Leo. Um, Jack. Oh, do you not think? I was hoping I might win Kate back with something like this. Look, there must be another bird that rhymes with shoe other than pigeon poo. Oh, hang on. Oh, yes, I've got it. I'm Leonardo DiCaprio. But they call me Jack, you know Come and buy my eco shoes Made from trees and a cock or two Right, oi, stop, stop there, that's shocking, that's pornographic But I meant a bird cockatoo Oh, right, oh, sorry, my mistake <laughs> Look, to be honest, it's awful, Leo Your heart's in the right place You're rich, you're good-looking It's time to move on from Kate Titanic was only a film, you know, Jack Leo, Jack. What? I've looked on Wikipedia. It was a true story. It's true. It's a true story. Um, OK, look, look whatever. I'm going to go now, but I'll call you back next time you do some other good stuff. So, bye now. Oi, oi then. And while we're on the subject of Leo, within the past year, Leonardo DiCaprio's foundation has donated a whopping $6 million to conservation campaigns, $3 million of which went to the World Wildlife Fund Tiger Conservation, and the other $3 million grant to Oceana to help save the oceans and marine mammals from unsustainable fishing methods. Now he's done it again and he's stepped up and donated $1 million to the Elephant Crisis Fund. And according to the World Conservation Network, the grant will be used to save elephants from the current ivory poaching crisis by funding on-the-ground projects that stop poaching, trafficking and the demand for ivory. So, that is a great example of... Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. Rich people doing good eco things. It's not where you're from, it's where you're at. And you can't help it if you're a posh rich twat. Um, well, that's all I've got time for. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you haven't, um, not a lot I can do about it, but come listen next time and maybe next time will be better. But um, thanks for listening anyway. Um, bye! The Grumpy Blog. Oh.